I don't know where my roach clip is. Hang on a sec. Here's Neil, and he's looking for his roach clip. <laughs> they heard that. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the THC Show. I'm your host, Neil Magnuson. This is the show where we talk about uh, THC. Truth, hope, and change. Hasn't changed. Uh, and the good news is we're back, and we're still broadcasting, and we're into our fifth year now. The bad news is not much has changed. Uh, the legal system here in Canada still rages on and it, it attempts to, its best as it can to get entrenched, while low barrier access is still the quest that we're on, and we have not succeeded in getting much traction any further than we already were. Uh, we will be in court coming up at the end of March and uh, see what the judge has to say about whether or not we can have our charter challenge against Health Canada. Meanwhile, the legal system of cannabis retail in, in Canada has, uh, has really done what we all thought it was going to do. And that is, is that the, the mom and pop operations don't do well at all. The big operations, they have profit margins that allow them, because of volume, to do much, much better. And now we find out that in Ontario... The Ontario government is going to increase the amount of licenses one group can hold from about 75 to 150. The uh, mom and pops are all very nervous, and well, they should be. Although I guess most of them stand to make some profit as they get bought out by the bigger uh, cannabis retailers. Meanwhile, cannabis exports continues to be the main focus of the licensed producers. It's not about the domestic market that they're concerned about. They want to have this model entrenched here so they can import it or, or pardon me, export it to other jurisdictions. And then Canada wants to continue to be the lead in providing those jurisdictions with high-priced cannabis. It's, uh, it's a terrible thing. It's not what we've been fighting for. For 25 years, myself personally and longer than that for many others, have been trying to get cannabis legalized up against extremely powerful forces who want to continue to capitalize on cannabis. Cannabis prohibition really protected the interests of the gangs. While the government was running around making sure the average person couldn't be providing cannabis to people, the gangs and the, and the, and the rich and the elite, they were all ready to they were all insulated from any, any prosecution and enforcement. They had big operations going on. And that's what Prohibition was doing. It was protecting those people. And here we have it going on again today. We have legalization in Canada. Now, granted, the average person, although I'm not sure even the, the below average person, can go and buy their cannabis from a government outlet. And below average people are, are doing that. Average and above average people, they know better if they're cannabis consumers and they're still getting it where they always got it. The government instituted a legalization by the rich and for the rich. It was quite a scheme. They managed to legalize it so that people that have, you know, a job and a fair bit of money, uh, you know, the average middle class person, they can afford to go and buy some cannabis in the government store. Hell, it's not that much more expensive than it is to buy cannabis in the unregulated market. But the unregulated market, the prices are high because those people are at risk of prosecution and uh, serious penalties. So that's why they keep the price up there. Bottom line to all of this is, for the average low-income person, the price of cannabis is still out of reach. They can only buy small amounts, be it from a government store, which hopefully they're not doing, or from the unregulated marketplace. Yes, the legal stores now have cheaper cannabis, and they now have better cannabis. The better cannabis is not cheaper. The cheaper cannabis is not better. Anybody who uses cannabis knows that if you're given an opportunity to buy cannabis and you have cheap cannabis and you have more expensive, better cannabis, 
you're going to figure out how to get some extra money and buy the better cannabis because the cheap cannabis just isn't going to do it. Nobody wants to buy cheap cannabis. They're only buying it if they can't afford it. So the government is allowing the people that can't afford their $15 grams to have it at $5 a gram. $5 a gram is still $2,500 for one pound. One pound. Now, a pound of cannabis sounds like a lot. But it is no more a pound than any other pound. Pound of blueberries, pound of raspberries, pound of strawberries, pound of grapes. It's a pound. What do you normally pay for a pound of some type of growing fruit or vegetable? A couple hundred bucks? <laughs> nope. 50 bucks? Nope. 20 bucks? Uh uh. 10 bucks? Sorry. 10 bucks a pound is still way out of reach for most families in Canada. At $10 a pound, if you have a family, you're probably not buying those grapes or strawberries or blueberries that they've priced at $10 a pound. You'll see some person in a fancy scarf and a suit or some nice dress and a, a pretty purse walk up to the fruit aisle and help themselves to some $10 a pound fruit. But you will not see the average mother or father pushing a cart, trying to save money, trying to look for deals, trying to feed their family in a tough economy, they're not buying the $10 a pound fruit. $10 a pound. Wow, that sounds like a lot when you're talking blueberries and strawberries and grapes. Doesn't sound a lot when you're talking about cannabis. Why is that? It doesn't take any more to grow a pound of cannabis as it does to grow a pound of blueberries or strawberries. In fact, that pound of cannabis is going to yield more per square meter than anything else that a farmer grows. The yields are spectacular. Yields are pretty good for people who don't know how to grow. You can almost get a pound off a plant. But you can imagine how much more than that a real farmer is going to get. Cannabis plants can be maxed right out. They're going to get so much more than they're going to get for any plot of strawberries or bushes of raspberries, or blueberries. But people are willing to pay $5 a gram. People are willing to pay $15 a gram. It's happening. Go to a government store and have a look for yourself. I have a confession to make. After five years of legalization, I have actually now smoked some legal weed. I know, I know. I'm embarrassed too. You did what? Well, I w <laughs> it was a dare. How do you, how do you not, well, uh, how do you, that, that explains it. Oh, yeah, yeah, voice is off camera here. So, and it was a good friend of mine that, uh, that I trust a lot. And he said, this weed that I got at the government store is pretty damn good. It's tasty and it's powerful. And I said, well, that had to happen, didn't it? The government swag couldn't always be shitty. Eventually, they were going to come up with good weed. What did you pay for this pre-rolled joint of concentrates and three different types of weed? Wait for it. Sit down if you're not sitting down. 34 dollars the government stores have single 1.5 joints that sell for 34 dollars mind you they don't get all of that some of the people that pre-rolled those joints get some of that some of the people that grew the weed that went into those joints get some of that some of the people who made that weed into concentrates to put in that joint, they get some of that. And governments at every level get a whole bunch of that. And that's why it's so expensive. Now this fellow who had that, he could afford a $34 joint. It's nothing. It's just chump change. But for the average person, one 
single joint of cannabis, $34. Way out of reach. Way out of reach. You're, you're going to be buying the $15 cannabis or the $12 a gram cannabis or maybe the $10 a gram cannabis. And the poor people, if they were forced, if there was no other way, and they needed cannabis so badly that they're willing to go in and do what they can, they're going to be walking out with $5 a gram schwag. But you're going to have to smoke probably two 1.5 joints to get much out of, as opposed to one $34 joint where a couple puffs is probably all you need. It's way out of whack. And you know, I wouldn't care. It wouldn't matter to me that they're selling $34 joints. Of course they are. We've had expensive weed forever. The rich people, they figure out how to spend money on things that they want that is more than the average person spends because they want to feel like they got more money than other people and so they want to be able to spend more. We learned that at the Herb School way back when we set up at Maine and Hastings. We tried to keep our prices down and reasonable. We didn't want to have expensive weed except people wanted expensive weed. We learned that there's a percentage of people out there that if you got the same quality of weed and one we're going to charge you considerably more for than the other, they're going to buy the expensive one. Because the expensive one has to be better, doesn't it? They spent more money on it. At least that's how they feel about it. And that's how they feel when they're telling other people about it. I spent $34 on this joint. I'm rich. Look at me. But the people that are buying the, the cheap stuff, because they need cannabis, and they can't afford those prices, well, this is cruel and unusual punishment to a marginalized group of people that suffer in their life and could really use some good cannabis to help them out. It's cruel and unusual because it's not expensive to grow cannabis. It can be. That's all fine. We're that close, are we? can be expensive to grow cannabis. Some people want expensive cannabis. Some people want to go and spend a lot of money on cannabis so that they can feel it's great. So they can tell other people that they're great. It's okay. I don't have a problem with that. It's always been there. It's always going to be there. What I have a problem with is a government of public servants that decide after public pressure and science to legalize this product that they have spent billions of our tax dollars to try to annihilate. I am not okay with those public servants deciding that legalization is the right thing to do, but making it affordable ain't going to happen on their watch. The pressures on governments over the last hundred years in Canada to maintain cannabis prohibition have been enormous. Pressure by millionaires and, and the U.S. government, if that's not enough. I guess it's 419. I get one more minute. You guys got a minute to either listen to what I have to say or roll up a joint and they get ready. But the pressure on the, on the Canadian government to keep cannabis illegal was obviously major. Because you can't tell me that Canadian governments over the last hundred years haven't had the brains. These are, these are good Canadian people that were smart enough to win an election. You're telling me they don't have the brains? They never had the brains enough to properly look into what it was they were making criminal and, and charging people vast sums of money for through tax dollars and fines? that they didn't know? No, they know. They've known for a long time. You put a joint beside a jar of whiskey, and which one is going to be better for your people? Which one should you help the citizens of your country obtain and use? The whiskey or the weed? It's a no-brainer.
People with no brains can figure that one out. Governments who are supposed to have brains somehow missed it. For a hundred years they missed it. Uh, I guess because I started the show late, I cut myself short from my, my, my rant here. You can continue while I'm here. <laughs> it's 420. We got to honor 420. Come on in, Glenn. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> it's going all right. Uh, oh, remember, when the government said we were looking for brains, they thought they said trains and they took a slow one. <laughs> I think this government is uh, pretending that they live in times where there were no trains. <laughs> Probably. Eh? That if you wanted to get somewhere, you had to jump on the back of a dinosaur. Uh, happy War 20, everybody. Let's light, let me light this. Yeah, thing. let's get it, let's get it up. Let's get it. Uh, let's get it going. What are you smoking today? Concentrates. Oh, that's good. Me too. Wow. I got butter in mine and shatter and, and some green too. <laughs> I got some really nice live rosin and some diamonds. Oh, nice. And See? then I, I still have my, my regular mix of uh, Oh yes. Isn't that the Kirk stuff? Oh yeah, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna Well you're you gonna, said oh, you brought it up, you said something about legal uh, weed. Yeah, not on the show I did it, but <laughs> I don't know what Kirk thinks of that. You know uh, our 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 past friend uh, Kirk oh, Tucson. Oh I didn't give his last name now. I just said Kirk. That's all right. <laughs> I'm going to out him. All right, you're out of <laughs> I, I, I I got to finally see Kirk after a number of years. I haven't seen him since uh, since he went to the dark side. Oh, to the dark side. Kirk. Uh, the force is strong. Kirk uh, took took a took a journey for cash to the dark side. He went around the world once, came back, and now he's on uh, still the dark side. Nice. Uh, me, he says, I hear you did the same thing. I said, No, I I've been around the world a couple times, uh, but I haven't. I didn't go into the dark side, and I'm still not there. But I did no. smoke one illegal joint. Yeah, one couple, dark side uh, joint. One dark side. Of <laughs> the force made so, you do it. <laughs> Kirk, Kirk is a lawyer. Uh, he was my campaign manager back in 2005. He was a lawyer working with John Conroy. There is a name I don't like to mention. Yeah, but he's also working with Jack, isn't he? No. Kirk and, uh, no. and Jack, no? no? I don't think so. I think so. I, I think they're in the same office I, or something. I didn't think Kirk was in an office. Oh. Maybe oh, I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't really know. I, I well, guess. Well, I have an email see, from I, Jack is passing me on to Kirk. So this is why I think oh. this. Oh. Right? Yes. Because remember when he was helping he me, He may right? well have that going on. I really Maybe. don't know. Like I say, I lost track of Kirk. Um, he, um, he went and worked for an LP. <coughs> and... Uh, Fleece them for a whole bunch of money is what I understand, and <coughs> that's a good thing if you do that. I'm I suppose. Yep. But um, I don't know what he helped them with. Hmm. I I mentioned him. I, I hope that he's not helping them put down low barrier access to cannabis. I hope that that he's helping to further the cause of low barrier access. And I think he said that he would do that or was doing that. Uh, he gave me a nice big bud of some pretty decent weed. It to smells. Not too bad as well, you know? Oh, yeah. Not yeah, too yeah. bad. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. Kind of dry. I said, uh, uh, I said, yeah. did you grow that? Uh, you know, <laughs> because what I did see from Kirk last was that he had left that contract. He had, he had finished his contract with the legal guys. I'm going to like this. Yeah, lay that up. <coughs> and he was working with Matt Barron on Legal Pot mm -hmm. in a huge outdoor field yeah. um, on some sort of a cart where he's hovering down the bottom edge of it, putting in plants. Oh, really, as, eh? As you go. As, you, as it goes along. Wow, eh? So, I, like an assembly line. Yeah, like, yeah. The way, like the way real farmers do things, you know? So I thought that's what he was doing, was he was just now semi-retired as a lawyer and was uh, growing plants for the legal marketplace. Uh -huh. But uh, maybe he's doing other things. I didn't get a long time to talk to him, unfortunately, because I have work to do. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you do, don't you? Yeah, every day I'm every here. Day. The only real, real break I get is this show. Yeah. Um, there is a, once every couple months, I do take a trip to go and get more supplies. That takes me all day, so I'm gone for a day. Yeah. And get... Other than that, I'm gone for an hour and a half, uh, some days, maybe even most days, delivering, picking up, doing what has to be done out there in the world. And uh, and there's lots to be done. Out and there's there in lots the world. to be done. And I never want to be too far away from here, because unlike Kirk and Matt, um, I'm still a criminal, 
And uh, you are. I wear it like a badge, I guess, <laughs> because uh, you know I live in an upside down world. Yep. And uh, I'm a person that was born into a family of ethics, of religion, of uh, wanting to do the right thing, of wanting their children to do the right thing. It was drilled into me all my upbringing, all throughout my upbringing, to do the right thing and what the right thing was and all the rest of that. <coughs> and what I decided I wanted to be was I wanted to be the good guy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the good guy that protected the the innocent people from the nasty bullies that would use, use them and take advantage of them. I was a big brother for two little brothers. My dad was a bully, and I think that's where I got all that from. Mm -hmm. Certainly never wanted to be a criminal. I did grow up in East Vancouver for the first uh, 12, 13 years, and Surrey after that. If, that, anybody, if anybody knows what that means. That taught you some stuff, didn't it? <laughs> my parents were very naive. Their idea was, oh my goodness, look at the effect the city is having on our son. Let's get him out of the city. Yeah. So they took me to jail. I mean, they took me to Surrey. <laughs> jail. <laughs> they took me to jail, didn't they? I was a, that was a purposeful slip there. Sorry, Annie Barbara. I, I, was, I was looking for a... I was looking for a, a better word than jail. I was looking for a, something that would step it up from the chaos of the downtown east side of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Because the chaos of Surrey, when I lived there, was uh, considerably uh, larger than the chaos I was dealing with here in downtown east side of Vancouver. Um, there was actual gangs of teenagers. Um, not so much on the downtown east side. It was more like just a bunch of you know, semi-poor people, yeah. you know, with, with questionable ethics that, you know, we're willing to, you know, rip each other off, steal things, do bad things, fight, that kind of stuff. But when I got to Surrey, it was a whole other level. Mm -hmm. It was like, wow. Yeah, I used to live in Surrey in the 90s, so. I went to Mary Jane Shannon. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well, man, you still smoking Mary Jane. <laughs> How, how, how cool is that? How right? cool is that? I went to a school called Mary Jane and I'm still smoking Mary Jane. <laughs> and you eat her too. <laughs> I was the last one to go to Mary Jane Shannon. But were you? One of the last ones. Why? Did she get busted? Yeah. Ah. Mary Jane Shannon was probably the poster child for the dysfunction of Surrey schools. Um... It was the epicenter of uh, crime for young people, for absenteeism from school, for fights, for sure. And I was in the middle of that. And uh, I wasn't very big, so I got picked on a lot. The bullies like smaller people. I had to fight pretty much every day that I went to school in Surrey. I got involved in all kinds of different things because of my friends and what they were doing. And... Uh, I managed to shed most of that stuff as I moved into adulthood. Mm -hmm. well, that's but good. I couldn't shed the use of cannabis. No. Nope. Why should we? Well, that was it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I couldn't come up with a good reason to do that other than it was against the law. But by that time, I was of a thinking mind going, but, 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 yeah. how is this a crime? A crime? You see, I... I had great interest in what was a crime. I had great interest in ethics because that's what my family was all about. And we discussed these things every night at the dinner table, all the different ins and outs of ethics. And my dad, who had wanted to be a police officer but was too short back then, after a while they started taking short people on purpose because they wanted to have the whole demographic of everybody. Yeah. But back in the day... You know, you were excluded for being a minority, you were excluded for being too short, you were excluded for lots of reasons, and he didn't get to be a police officer. And it wasn't He would have been a nasty police officer, I think, my dad, you know, if, if he didn't like you. If he liked you, he'd be like your uncle, and he'd give you a bit of a break, you know? <coughs> Maybe a slap in the head. Try to, scare, try to <laughs> scare you a little bit about yeah. what you just did, <coughs> you know, and send you home and, and you know, and maybe tell your mom and dad about it, but... You know, anyway, Dad wanted to be a police officer. I, I didn't know any better. I, you know, I took law in school. Uh, I never wanted to be a police officer, but... No. No, that, that no. never occurred to me. It was never one of the things I wanted to do. 
but uh, but I did want to have respect for the law, and uh, I did have a working understanding in my mind, at least, of the ins and outs of legalities. Mm -hmm. You know what we, what made something a crime. Um, <coughs> a you, crime. You know, most of it was based in common law because when I was born, it was the the uh, British common law that was pretty much the basis of our laws mm -hmm. here. Uh, it was in the 80s when we went to the rule of law because we weren't really adhering to the, the uh, common law the common law anyway huh. uh, especially with drug prohibition they'd been uh, doing it for a while but after two years of common law aren't we married to it <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. In common law, so these are these are these are laws that have been worked and reworked for hundreds of years. Yeah. To try to get justice for the common people, and to try to get uh, uh, well justice, you know, to get the, the right balance. Yeah. And it's really hard to do that. It is. Oh, it is. It has to be fluid and flexible. Yet at the same time, with some boundaries and, and rules. Mm -hmm. But essentially, when it comes to a crime with common law, you, you need to prove that the person knew that what they were doing was wrong. So they had to have the presence of mind to understand the nature of their action was going to cause damage. They needed to cause damage for it to be a crime. You couldn't just think about it. Thought crimes weren't enough. Well, yeah, conspiracy. Conspiracy? That, 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 that covers thought crimes. If you think of murdering somebody, that's conspiracy to commit murder, and it's one of the hardest things to beat in the courts because they have to prove that you weren't thinking this. That's what conspiracy is. Wow. Yeah, conspiracy is I thought conspiracy is really, took more than one person. No, conspiracy is really hard to prove in court because it's only the thought. It's not the action. So if you have the intent to kill somebody, but they yeah. stop you before you do it, you can still be charged with conspiracy. Be charged with that, eh? Conspiracy to commit murder. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Just to think about it is is apparently the law. So we are all serious so criminals. We could, aren't we? That's why they've been doing a lot of uh, conspiracy <laughs> charges too, because it's really one of the hard things to beat, right? Um. Yeah, well, yeah, it is. It is. Now you screwed my whole argument up. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't doing that. I better light this. Yeah, yeah, I better, better light this up. Yeah. Again. I'm beating you. <laughs> well, it doesn't take much to beat me. No, <laughs> I'm just little. Uh, conspiracy is planning between multiple parties commit a, a, an eagle in an Ill, Ill, illegal act. That's yes. what I always believed it was. Yeah, I, I didn't think it was something inside a person's head. Well, you. Well, I guess who hasn't wanted to kill somebody? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not. I don't know. I'm not in everybody's I'm, head. I was explained to. But yeah. I would suspect that every one of us has, at one time or another, contemplated killing somebody. Not seriously, but you know, wishing that person was dead, wishing ill on that person, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. I never thought that could be an actual crime. I thought you actually had to do something. In fact, well, but it, <coughs> okay. uh, on my side, I could think of it, and I employ you to do it. That's then, conspiracy. Uh, yeah. Right. He said parties. Yeah. Like, you're, you're a party to it. Right? Yeah. So, but if I was Two to think people. about it and go murder, maybe that wouldn't be conspiracy. Conspiracy because oh. it's just myself. Okay. Right? So you're not 100 percent sure of your own law there that you're talking well, about. Well, I just know that it was the thought of something, and then with the parties. I believe a yes. conspiracy is when you conspire. Yeah. With somebody else. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I hire you. I'm conspiring. Now you've right? done something. Yes. Now you've done something. Yeah. You have. You have uttered out of your mouth yeah. a desire for me to do something yeah. of a criminal nature to somebody else. Yeah. That's doing something. Yeah. My argument was is that until you do something harmful, it's not really a crime. Hmm. Wow. I don't know if I'm right or not. I don't know either. <laughs> this is the Truth, Hope, and Change show. If you yeah. know that, that we're not telling the truth, boy, do we ever want to know about that. I don't mind being wrong. I actually appreciate it. Neil says somebody. it's superstitious, super, superstitious collusion. Superstitious collusion. Yes. But there again, to collude takes more than one. One person, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I, if I was just to do it myself, I'd probably try a conspiracy. As but soon if as you're I communicating it to somebody, somebody else, else, now you've yeah. done something. Yeah. 
Uh, in fact, you don't have to communicate it to any specific person. You could communicate a desire for death to individuals, mm -hmm. and and you, that is a crime. Mm -hmm. If other people could be uh, inspired by your words to go and do something like that, I think they could maybe get a crime in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, probably, because you've yeah. done something. Yeah. You didn't just think about it, you did something. My point is, is that with common law, they had uh, symbols of justice besides those things they had come to, to to try to figure out, you know, innocent until proven guilty. guilty yeah. uh, you know, did they have intent? Do you get to meet your victim there? Um, other things like that. There are these symbols of justice that are involved in common law, like the scales of justice, mm -hmm. the blindfolded older female yeah. that is in charge of determining justice with that set of scales. With the set of scales, on the one side of the scales, you've got to put, you know, what the damage do done was. Like, mm -hmm. what damage was done by your words mm -hmm. or your actions or mm -hmm. whatever, or inaction too. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that other side of the set of the scales is there to balance penalties with the damage. But you can't do that so, anymore. Well, it, if somebody it, takes somebody's stopped, life, you can't balance it out with taking somebody's life because capital punishment is no, not around anymore. No, but the state could find a punishment that would balance that. You know, maybe it would be a, a monetary fine, a loss of liberty. Um, oh yeah, you get twenty-five you know, years in prison, and they take your, all your money and they give it to the life. Vic, which yeah. is, they take it to the victim. I don't know. Yeah, you know, um, the, the the idea was is that the state in, in trying to dispense justice is looking for a way to balance the amount of damage that yeah. was done. Yeah. Um, and so, for a long time here in Canada, we were we had strayed from that. They had come up with where, if the government decides something is illegal, then the rule of law is going to work. It was in the 80s when they did this. That, that uh, if the government says it's illegal and they can prove you broke the law, then you get a penalty based on what everybody else got a penalty on. Mm. Other precedents that were set. So not an individual one-on-one, -on -one, who are you, what did you do, what was your intent, how much damage did you do, what is your past, and how do we now justify or, or, or make just what's happened here. Um, that wasn't at play anymore in Canada. It was simply, did you break the law? Here's the pre previous penalties that have gone out for doing that. And your lawyer is going to argue that you should have less of a penalty. And the crown, on behalf of the king or queen, is going to argue that you should have more of a penalty. And the judge is going to rule somewhere in between. And that's what we got. And it's called yeah. the rule of law. Yeah. And so for 100 years, all you had to do was have some of this on you. Yeah. Oh, I did. And some hash and some asses. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know? Or, or other, other powders and yeah, things, powders, you know? Yeah, powders, yeah, baby powder. Yeah. <laughs> so all you had to do was have a little bit of that on you, or a lot on you, or whatever. And they said, oh, no, we have a rule about that. You're not allowed to have that powder. You're not allowed to have that plant. Yeah. And we've been giving out these kind of penalties to other people for having that amount of these kinds of things, and so that's what we're going to give you. <laughs> there was no, well, hey... I didn't hurt anybody with this. No. I didn't steal it. Yeah. I had no intention to hurt anybody. All I intended to do was feel better. Mm -hmm. How is that a crime? Yeah. How it can is, that be a crime? It isn't. But it, it, you, you would, it was never a crime. 100 years ago, they, 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 they named it a crime and it yeah. stuck. Just because they decided to call it a crime doesn't make it a crime. It shouldn't make no. it a crime. Well, they convinced the world that it's a crime and then that's, they, they just made it like even more because we convinced well, now you're if, talking if about the people are saying it's a crime then yeah of course we're gonna follow the government or whatever i don't know it was well stupid. there is that you know there's social norms yeah about what people will and won't accept for whatever reason religious or who knows what but they're not crimes these social norms if you break them they're not crimes we don't typically have police officers running around enforcing these social norms no. although in today's world, we do have some of that. Yeah. Well, it's even illegal to spit on the street, right? But we don't have in cops. Sing in Singapore. Oh, what, here too? No. Yeah, on the sidewalk? Yeah, really? yeah on the sidewalk. Yeah, it's on the sidewalk, not the street, sorry. Ah. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, apparently, it's illegal, but it's something that they, do, they don't enforce. Well, <laughs> if, it's, if it's on the books, then I'd be careful about saying they don't enforce it. Okay. 
I think it would be agreed that they don't enforce it on any large scale. Yeah. But if it's there on the books, it wouldn't surprise me. Hmm. Hmm. If there's some enforcement going on. There's probably lots of laws in the books that are uh, uh, very archaic. So you had some playing cards that you came up with. I did. I did, yeah. They're do in. you want to do some of that? I don't know. Let's see. Do I still have them? Where did I put those? I think I put them up here, yeah. So we these, talked about that. Yeah, this is some uh, cannabis information on these cards. So, and it's... I'm oh. going to let you describe that and discuss that. I've got okay. somebody I have to talk to for a couple minutes. All right, so. sounds good. So, and, yeah, uh, so... Let's, I, let's I, do I, that. I got this book from Carly. <laughs> Just a Carly, minute. Right Carly Thiessen. <clears throat> and it says... Um, well, it says that stuff falls down. <laughs> memoirs of the playing cards. Uh, memoirs of the playing cards. So it just says the uh, first paragraph is, these cards are from at least 30 years of research. Um, all photos are lavishly displayed in our books. Lawrence Kernock Kern Kern works behind the, that unique behavior of people who like to get high. Yes, we do. We like to medicate. Via the ex extraordinary powers, they realize when... Uh, personal personifying their roles in the unique and authentic experiences so I got a deck of cards here and it, with these deck of cards you, there's information on them so let's see if I can get this open here alright there we go and uh, make it a crime and then it's taxable yeah I know eh? alright so um, I believe we'll just do a little shuffle here Let's see what these have on them. All right, so... Oh, no, I guess not. <laughs> this is just a picture. Um, this is another picture, so I'll just show you. It's, it's a ba basically a deck of cards, I guess. I guess I got it wrong. I thought that there was information on here about cannabis. As you can see, there's cannabis on the back of it. But it's just a bunch of pictures of people smoking pot. That's what it is while we're, while we're doing this. Uh... Yeah, secret herb. Uh, there is some writing on them, so... Oh, well, I thought this would be a great idea um, to be able to do this. Oh, wow, well, what's this one? This is a different one. It's not even a card, but uh, there we go. Just to show you. I don't know. Like the, These were a gift uh, to me. Um, this one is another card, too. Uh, Timothy Leary. Oh, I see. It's Timothy Leary. Gotcha. There we go. All right, so and what else do we got here? We got we got a jack of diamonds. <laughs> um, what do we got here? This one is high times, right? There you go, at, which is the ten of diamonds. There we go. But this is not what I thought it was. I thought there would be some information on here that uh, I could share with you guys that you might not know about. But uh, no, that's not that's not it is. Hey, well, are you back? Yeah. No, all right, are you all done now? This is my front, go. actually. It's there you uh, go. Similar to my back, but not quite as good looking. <laughs> Maybe the book has something in it. I don't know. I, I just was uh, under the impression that... Uh, I was under the impression you had something going on yeah, with those, and well, you knew it was hey, good. <laughs> we, did, we didn't know until we opened up the pack, right? You should have so, done it before the show. I could. I did the mic thing before the show, because that's really yeah. important, right? So... Yeah. <laughs> it's all okay. All we right. Thought, we thought we had some sort of a trivia thing going on for you. Oh, yeah. There, there is some stuff here well, all right. the, stuff. The, uh, uh, each of us can relate with our sense of uh, conscience to being a unique individual so there are there's some stuff in here I that I, I can read later on yeah I'll maybe have a look at it at some point too yeah what do you need what are you looking for well I was gonna have a drink of water well then get some water <sighs> yeah it's working great Mike thanks very much um, we're using it right now it's right here we just don't have it on camera that's all speaking of Mike yeah I'm like See? Right there. <laughs> How's it sounding? Does it sound better? The images are nice. Thank you very much. So speaking of Mike. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is something I wanted to do today for sure, which was to uh, give a bit of a shout out to some people that have been helping us out with the CSP, the Cannabis Substitution Program. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike Fuller... Uh, has been giving us uh, giving us another nice uh, donation. Fifty dollar donation. Fifty dollar donation. Yep. That's right. So that's the second time he's done that. Yeah, and then uh, Steve Niemi. He's, Niemi. He, he, Niemi. 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 Sorry about that. Yeah. I think I got it wrong the first time. I'm still <laughs> yeah, I know. The first time. And he told us that's how I remember. It's Niemi. Niemi. 
Steve Neamey, thank you so much. Um, become a regular donator of the CSP. That is so incredibly powerful for us. Yeah, he gives uh, them the, the people gummies. that donate on a regular basis uh, really keep this thing going, and the people that donate on a random basis also keep yeah, it going. Yeah, we, yeah. Random is always good too. So uh, thank you so much, Miss D. Uh, last time I went there, she gave me a nice donation as well. Uh, that's uh, you know we should put the yeah. That's not the right one. <laughs> there it is. We love I, the candy bar. <laughs> I wear so many hats, eh? <laughs> Miss D, uh, many hats. great donations as well. She uh, she provides uh, infused edibles. Uh, you can look her up and figure out how the candy bar can help you with that as well. She's on Facebook. So that's great. She's on Facebook. Yeah, the candy bar is on Facebook, so you can just look it up. And Michael the Cookie private. Monster. Oh, yep. Over six years of, of, of never six missing, basically. Six years. Wow. Of providing his, his magical cookies. Wow. The cookies that are... So healthy, no nuts, no sugar, uh, very, very healthy for people. Um, twisted extracts or Gorilla Ganja, amazing. Uh, Green Wilderness. Mad Hatter. Mad Hatter. All, all, all the people. Bridget. Uh, yeah, Bridget. Newton. Bridget. Bridget, Newton. Yeah. Bridget and Gary and Newton. So many have uh, helped us out and I just wanted to you know, do a shout out for those people as well. Uh, speaking of Newton, a uh, big shout out to the other CSPs out there. Uh, Newton, Surrey, Langley, uh, Halifax. Halifax, over four years now. They need some help. Um, I'm sure all of these CSPs can use some help. It's all driven by donations and volunteers. So if you can help, if you can vo donate something or volunteer somehow if, if it's needed, um, you know, that's what keeps these things going. And, and so shout out to everybody who's been doing that. Um, Great to see all of this stuff happening. No, oh, we, we couldn't do it without them. We could not do it without them. No, we, we really, it would be a really, really hard thing to do without you people. It's really, really... Uh... Well, and as we move forward with the courts and in our, <coughs> our battle with the government, um, also, you know, we, the more the merrier, the, the better it is. The more people that are being helped by us, the more that the, we're reaching out throughout different tentacles in Canada. That'll all help to pave the way, hopefully, mm. to our quest for low barrier access uh, community cannabis stores. That's what this show has been about for all the years we've been doing it. We're still on that, that uh, track. I really hope one of these days I get to start the show by saying, I have some really good news for you today. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> you know, the government yeah. has finally either been forced or they've understood that they have to allow for the poor people and the sick people, the addicted people to have reasonable low barrier storefront access to cannabis and that the whole idea that there needs to be all these different levels of government collecting taxes off of off of cannabis and there needs to be all these regulations to protect people from what is one of the safest and most benign plants and medical plants on the planet that stuff all needs to go away because not only does there need to be low barrier access for for consumers to to cannabis but there needs to be low barrier access for the retailers and the producers to get into the marketplace as well. And so that's what we're looking to have happen there. So thanks to all the donators, Miss D, Candy Bar, everybody else. Thanks to all the other cannabis substitution programs out there for what you're doing. And uh, big old thanks to the, Canucks. the Vancouver Yay! Canucks. First in the, in the Pacific no, Division. No, no, they? no. Oh, in the Pacific, they're yes, first. Yes, they are. Yes, no, they are. They're way out in front and first. Yep. In the Western Conference, I think they're now two points behind Winnipeg. Which is the second place. Second place, good. you know. Yep, yep. And, uh, and those two teams are 1-2 in the whole NHL. That's good. Well, no, Boston's right up there with them as well. Oh, that's Boston. Yeah, Boston's yeah. up there as well. <laughs> that's I'm not Bo sure that's Boston. That's my favorite team, uh, I, is Boston. Certainly in Vancouver, Boston I doesn't count. In Toronto. <laughs> but, yeah, what a season for the Vancouver Canucks. It continues on. They're the highest scoring team in the National Hockey League. They've broken all kinds of personal records and then matched other of the best years that they've ever had and then some. But the All-Star game. Yes, I know, all five, right? I was saying on the show before the All-Star Game selections happened that there's five players on the on the Canucks that all deserve to be there. Mm -hmm. They can't all be there. Yeah, that, they are. that doesn't happen, and does it? The people voted it. It happened. So the league appoints one player per team to the All-Star team, and then I think there's 12 other positions that the fans get to vote on. Yeah. 
And of those positions the fans were voting on, they voted in the four other Canucks. Incredible. And, and the coach. And the coach. The coach is there too. The coach is there too. Yeah, Rick he's going to is there. coach one of the teams. So yep. Brock Besser and Elias Peterson and, and JT Miller and the Thatcher Demko all got voted by the fans yep. onto the All-Star team. Yep. I'm not sure what's more special. Who's got the bigger bragging rights? Is it Quinn Hughes who got appointed <laughs> by the league? Or is it the other four that got appointed by the fans? And you got to know that if Quinn wasn't appointed by the league, he would have been appointed by the fans. Did for you sure. hear what our last coach said on the weekend on this one of the sports shows about when he was working here, Bruce, no. uh, as, as a Vancouver coach? Right. He was... <clears throat> He didn't drop the name, but he was told to make Quinn Hughes the captain. Mm -hmm. And he refused to do it. And he announced this. He broke that news so who on would... Sportsnet uh, uh, during the weekend. I think it was on Saturday. But he broke, they, had, they interviewed him. And he said, I've got to get this out. And he said, I'm not going to name who it was in the organization. Well, there's only one. But now Quinn Hughes. Bruce, Bruce there Quinn you is, are, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bruce, there you are. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and that had to be ownership. It had to be the Aquilinis. There's nobody else that could put that pressure yeah. on him uh, to have him do that. Um, and, uh, you know, he's no longer the coach. So, I mean, that might say something for that as well. Um, I love Bruce Boudreau, and, and he's a coach for a certain type of team, and he to coaches a certain way that works for some teams. Mm -hmm. In the case of the Canucks, with all this amazing talent that they had, what they needed was more structure yeah. than what he was providing. And Rick's doing and, well. Uh, and good wow. on good on um, Mr. Rutherford. Jim has done a fantastic job to bring in a, an amazing coaching staff. Uh, they've put some incredible players together to, to be a supporting cast for these guys. And we're having the the year of my life. That, yep. uh, you know, I've waited all my life for this year. There you go. Not that they're going to win the cup. I'll never no. believe that till it happens. But we'll get to the playoffs. I am for not sure. willing to hurt myself that badly. <laughs> not again. Fifty years of doing that was enough for me. Uh, no, 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 no. We don't need you. To I'm hurt not yourself. talking cup. <laughs> It doesn't matter about Cup. They're dominating the league. They're dominating the games. They are fun to watch yep. every game. I don't expect they're going to get all the way to the Stanley Cup final and win it. We'll see. They could. We could get to the final. They could. You could turn me into a blubbering schoolgirl at some point and, still. And then we'd have to show that Vancouver will not have a riot when we lose. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If we could do that. Let's not ever really, do that really, again. No, let's not do that again. Let's have right? a riot because poor people can't get access to proper cannabis. Yeah. And the people are dying from addiction that could be getting cannabis high-dose edibles and getting through withdrawal, but the government won't let them. Hmm. Let's riot about that. <laughs> if we're going to riot about anything, let's, let's riot, riot about, about that. Get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, JT so, needs to get out. I don't think there's much more. No? I don't got much more, except to say that um, the government has now instructed the licensed producers to destroy 1,700 tons yes. of regulated cannabis. That they had people grow for them. That it was grown according to regulation, <laughs> that could be used to help the people that need it, that could be used to bring the prices down, oh, Yep. but instead they're just going to spend some more money to have it properly destroyed. And then you just gave it to you. Imagine what we could do with 1,700 tons, how many people we would I could sleep on. comfortably on a oh. bed of weed. Yeah, we could. <laughs> we have a weak filled mattress. <laughs> it's incredible that uh, it's, it's yeah it is. that uh, that they would be doing that. This is not the legalization we fought for. I'll tell you, uh, in our in our world of legalization, the excess would all go to the poor people. The government would make sure that everybody had reasonable, easy access to cannabis. There would be no taxation on a commodity that helps our society in really serious, beneficial ways, financially and otherwise. There would be supplementation of cannabis. There would be ways that make, the government would make sure that, it, that the good stuff is at reach for everybody. So, <coughs> Sorry, I have to interrupt you. Go ahead. Ron is saying, hey, Neil and Glenn, I'm starting up my very, I'm Ron McNabb, very own live cannabis video podcast. I'd be very interested and honored to be able to play a quick commercial in the form of a public service announcement to help get the word of the CSP out. Um, cool. If you are interested, we can connect sometime in my StreamYard studio or email, whichever meets your convenience. Would you be interested in doing oh, something like that? Yeah, yeah, 100%. yeah. let's Thanks do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Like, right. yeah, we can, that'd be awesome. Thank you very much. Always uh, looking for any opportunity to further what we're doing here. I appreciate uh, anybody giving us any ideas or any opportunities. That's fantastic. All right, there you go. 
All right. Thank you. Yeah, well, reach out to me, not Ron, or reach out to Neil. I'm a little bit easier to get a hold of sometimes because I called him Rob. Rob, Rob, Ron. <laughs> but yeah, reach out. We can work things out. Being his producer, I'm sure I can get a hold of him. <laughs> you know, he knows how to get me. <clears throat> yeah, and you usually we're in the mm. studio here uh, an hour to an hour and a half before the show, so maybe we could do something like that. And yeah, we'll maybe put together something. Do 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 something with you before the show, and well, then, he'll and, let us know what he wants. Yeah, yeah. And so. He'll, Reach out to me, Ron. You know how to get hold of me, so we can we'll work this out. All right. All right. right, You want me to yeah go back to producing? We're gonna make Mm -hmm. it a short show. All right. I have to make it a short show. All right. We'll see you next week. All right. Well, we don't have much content anyway this week. (laughs) You've got lots of content. (laughs) Uh, Not like most shows. I guess I can lose this one now. Well, come on. We'll go back to this one. Hey, we're going to go outside. We are, because what this show is really all about is the CSP, typically. Uh, The CSP is the Cannabis Substitution Program. Cannabis Substitution Program was a a citizen's initiative. It was a response uh, from the cannabis community to the overdose crisis that uh, had uh, descended on Vancouver for the second time in in a couple decades. First time it was China White that hit, this time it was fentanyl. And uh, having prior knowledge that uh, cannabis edibles in the form of a higher dose than what the government was offering by a substantial amount could help people get through the withdrawal which is the one barrier that keeps people on these drugs what gets people on these drugs is typically pain and depression and uh, and doctors who are willing to prescribe opiates uh, like candy for slivers and broken toenails and headaches and anything else that came along because the more they prescribed, the more bonuses they got. And, uh, and then came OxyContin, and the doctors were sold a bill of goods, that, that, uh, and they were easy to convince because it's what they all wanted. They all wanted to be able to get their patients pain relief. And so here comes this drug. It's an opioid, but it's different than other opioids because it's got a coating on it, and it's time release, and it's not addictive, and that's what they were told, and that's what they told their patients. And... Uh, Turns out that all you had to do was get that uh, coating off of that pill and crush it up, and now it's highly addictive, highly dangerous, and uh, a whole generation of people has been lost because of the medical profession's embracing of this pharmaceutical uh, opioid, and uh, that's resulted in downtown east sides all over the country, all over North America and around the world, of people badly addicted to opioids and unable to get off and the people that are visible in that the ones that you can see on the streets that are obviously suffering them and the ones that are invisible that are that are suffering in silence and invisibility they all want off they almost all would love to be able to just stop doing it but they can't because there's a barrier to doing that and that's withdrawal it's not a serious craving for more of that fantastic drug it's about your body is used to it you're only using it now to maintain some level of normalcy because as soon as you stop you lose that normalcy and you slide into pain and anguish and the pain and the anguish becomes extremely intense and they call it withdrawal and it can last four to seven days or more and it's really, really difficult to go through. And if you've never experienced it, you can't understand it. You can, you can try to wrap your brain around it. But for those people who have experienced it, they get it. They know that you try your hardest. You want to get off so bad. You're determined. But the pain is too great. And back they go. And on it again. And again. And again. And over and over again. And treatment very seldom ever works. Rehab and detox very seldom ever last. And it's by design for the most part because treatment people need people to treat. They don't want to cure all the addicts. What would they do? They'd be out of their government grants. So believe it or not, it's a horrible revelation. Um, uh, There's a movie, uh, the name is escaping me, that's terrible. But anyway... There's a movie about it, about how these treatment places are designed to have people not succeed the first several times through so that they can keep getting more and more grants because they get paid so much money every time a person spends a night there from you and me, 
from taxpayers. We're paying for these people to be in treatment. And, and if they get past the first 30 days, there's a huge jump in how much of our tax dollars goes to the treatment people to treat these people. Not that it becomes any more expensive to treat people for, for the next 30 days, just that they want an incentive to have people continue on and not quit after 30 days. And if you get into that last 60 to 90 day period, it is extremely lucrative. So the treatment places, in many cases, they just want those beds filled. They just want people to come and stay for 90 days. They'll even give you a kickback of cash to do that. But get you off the drugs? That's not what they're interested in. In fact, in many cases, they're providing drugs to these addicts to keep them hooked so they can bring them back again and have another boat of tax dollars. It's terrible. But what works for people is cannabis edibles. I was going to hold up the weed, but you know, the weed really has to be turned into edibles for the most part. You have to take all the little crystals that are on here and get rid of all of the plant matter that they're attached to and then take those little crystals of medicine and mix them into food and then consume them that way. And it's a different way of ingesting. It doesn't go through the lungs. It's not, it's not something that's coming in through vapor or smoke. It's being put directly into your body through your mouth and through your digestive system. It goes through your liver. It can last for hours longer than smoked cannabis. And it can be way more intense to the point of even knocking you unconscious, although not enough to kill you. And that's sort of the key here, is that the drugs that these other people are addicted to and keep going back to, any dose can be fatal. Whereas no dose can be fatal with cannabis edibles or cannabis. So it is a safe alternative to those risky drugs that people are involved with. And yet the government refuses to understand that. They plead ignorance. They say, but it's against the law. It's a criminal offense to do that. These things are dangerous. <laughs> That's what they're telling us, not in so many words. But they're not going to support what we do here. And what we do is we make it easy for people to get this stuff. We make it easy for people to get it at no cost, if that's where they are in their lives. We make it easy for people to get it at a cost, because there's a whole bunch of those invisible addicts that will not identify themselves, take part in a program, line up for blocks to get cannabis edibles for free. They won't do that. Nobody can know what's going on with them. They're embarrassed about it. They need discreet, low barrier access to the higher dose edibles so they can get off that stuff. The government knows it, but the government says, no, no, we can't allow anybody to have more than 10 milligrams per dose unless there's a doctor monitoring their journey, which is complete and utter bullshit. Doctors can't monitor your journey with any knowledge of where to, to, where to steer it next anyway. That's an individual thing. People know themselves. They know when they've eaten too much. They know when they don't want to go back and do that again. The doctor can't tell you what too much is. Nobody knows for you. Everybody's different. But the government says, no, we're not going to allow people just to have access to this stuff through a retail outlet, through a storefront, because they're too dangerous. Meanwhile, you can have access to this stuff, depending on what province you live in, but most of the provinces, you can, if your landlord agrees, if your strata agrees, if you have the right situation, you can grow yourself some plants. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to grow four plants of maturity. A mature cannabis plant can be 20 feet tall. It can yield over 10 pounds of weed. So you're allowed to have large amounts of weed. You're allowed to extract from those from that cannabis. Come on up, baby. Come on up and say hi. You're allowed to extract the cannabinoids off that cannabis. And then you're allowed to make edibles out of it. So it's not that you can't have or make higher dose edibles within your household under no regulations and restrictions. They don't even give you advice. But they won't allow it into store where you could buy it in a childproof container, where you could have standardized dosages marked on the packages, make it a lot easier for people to take the right amount. But they don't care. 
They don't really care. They don't really care about whether or not people get too much cannabis or not. Whether you OD to the point of now you're going to sleep for two days. They don't care. There's no hospital costs associated with any of that or cost to society or anything. They don't care about that. Obviously. If they did, you wouldn't be able to grow your own. You wouldn't be able to extract cannabinoids off the ca cannabis plant. We've won both of those court battles. What they care about is, number one, making big time money for their friends and investors and themselves. And number two, not being accused and convicted of being heinous, bloody criminals for restricting access to this ma magnificent, miracle, medicinal, natural cure that would have helped so many people with so many things for so long had the government not decided to prohibit it on behalf of corporate gangs and other criminal drug gangs and for their own ambitions of control over people. It's an amazing story. It's a terrible crime against all of us that is continuing today with legal weed and illegal weed. We have a country where there's legal weed. That would be this stuff. And there's illegal weed. That would be this stuff. This stuff was grown outside of the cartel and outside of the regulations. This stuff was, was grown with licenses from the cartel and within all of those restrictions. I would smoke this before I would smoke that. I'll tell you right now, as a connoisseur of cannabis, the illegal cannabis I have on this plate is considerably better than the legal cannabis. Nothing, nothing terribly wrong that I can see with the legal cannabis, although I don't know what the growing was like. I don't know whether they irradiated it after the end of that. I don't know what pesticides they may have not flushed out of there properly. I don't really know. I can't, can't really know about this either. But this, but this has a proven track record for me. The suppliers we use, we've been using for a long time, we've never had a problem with how it burns or how it tastes or anything like that. No bad reactions. The same can't be said for the legal weed. But this is the system we're in. It is extremely corrupt. And so here we are, seven years coming up in another month, to the start of a program that has now dispensed hundreds, well, at least multiple tens of millions of cannabis high-dose edible milligrams of ca cannabis high-dose edibles. And I, don't, I shouldn't say high-dose, just regular dose, proper dose. Millions, tens of millions of milligrams of this so-called dangerous commodity has been dispensed into this neighborhood just through our program. And how many people have been harmed by that? Other than some people who eat too much, have an uncomfortable experience, no physical problems as a result, no long-term anything, no damage to anything. In fact, that sleep that they had for a couple of days, their body probably spent going to work and you know, fixing a bunch of stuff with all the cannabinoids in the system. No problems, no complaints, multiple tens of millions of this dangerous cannabinoid milligram edible put out there. And I'm telling you, there are thousands and thousands of people that have been helped by what we've done. So if that doesn't explain to you how corrupt this world is, you're not paying attention. I'm here to tell you, the federal government of Canada is in bed with a bunch of rich, greedy corporatists and they are manipulating our pricing, they're manipulating our economy, they are taking all that they can take from us, they are robbing us blind, and as corrupt as can be, and these public servants are in on it. So well, that's what we do with the CSP, we hand out uh, cannabis sedibles and uh, it's all done by donation and volunteers. Uh, the sale of cannabis is not done by the CSP. It's done by the Healing Wave, a, a separate entity that provides that access to those people that won't part join the program. And uh, let's go have a look at what we're doing.
One second, I'm gonna jump off the Wi-Fi here. <laughs> Well, here we are. It's uh, our right. once a week uh, THC weather report. Right or right here, right now. There was <laughs> moments ago. I'll tell you that for free. Vancouver Canuck reference there. If anybody uh, follows that. Another thing I'll tell you for free is that it's uh, damn cold out here. <laughs> uh, we've had uh, a week or so or more of uh, pretty pretty cold weather out here. Uh, it's been really hard on the people that don't have a place to go. We got lots uh, we, of weather tonight too. And it's going to snow again tonight. It warmed up a little bit today, but warmer is still not warm by any means. Minus 3, minus 6, minus 9, minus 14. Those are all pretty cold here on the wet coast. Uh, it's a very humid type of cold. I have people here from Ontario telling me that the minus 14 that we've got here feels like the minus 30 that they used to experience back in Ontario. Which, by the way, was cold. How are you doing, Bernard? How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Welcome to Pot TV. This is a Pot TV oh. show. <laughs> How are you making out in the Good cold? Boy. All right, boy. All the cold just don't bother me. Don't bother you. Yeah, don't, don't bother you. You're losing a bit of weight, eh? Yeah. So yeah, and uh, anyway, I'm glad you're uh, getting through it all okay, and uh, you know, not too much, uh, not too much more winter to go, and then. Uh, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. You're still working at the, uh, not down there, because I see that's finished. No, Lafarge, uh, no, I laid off for a couple of months now. I see. Well, well, that's a good project be, down there. It looks pretty good. Won't be long, I'll be going again. I can't wait. Nice. Good my time, you. I think my time here, too, is uh, getting a little short down here. It's yeah. Street Treaty, yeah. I see. I'm, well, look, I'm looking out for I'd love to see you get out of this neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Sure. I just come went from Nofields to here on the bus, and Tanya, one guy just caught down like saw me. He was whacked out of it, and he drooled and snot, and he touched my hand, and I'm like... And you can't be ignorant, but you, you sometimes I just want to say, listen, man, yeah, we'll jump yeah. off a wharf. Yeah, yeah. stay out of my space. Fuck. I know, people need to respect each other's space. So anyway, great to see you, Bernard. Yeah, you too. You're doing well. We'll talk to you soon. Good to see you. Good to see you. Always a pleasure, buddy. Here we are up here. As, uh, you know, this is the start of where we you know, parked the RV once we got evicted from the store because the municipal government welched on their promise to give us a license. They said they'd do that when the federal government does after telling us they would. And then uh, the federal government, well, it's been over three years, going on three and a half years now, and there's uh, still no support from them. So we're still in an RV. Instead of in the store that we just came out of, which could be a beautiful low barrier access cannabis store for people to have some dignity, some safety to go into, some warmth. Instead, they have to come to the RV. They have to stand outside at the window out here and they be treated like second class citizens because that's what the governments are insisting that, uh, that we do. In fact, they're insisting we don't do it at all. <laughs> the only way they're allowing it is if we make these people feel like they're second or third class citizens. We're a block away from the police station. The police drive by all day long. They nod and wave at me for the most part. They know what we are doing. They know who we are. We've been raided. We were raided uh, and, and charged almost two years ago. There's the firemen. It'll be, uh, it'll be March this year coming up. It's been two years since uh, that raid happened and uh, we're still waiting for it to go through the courts. There's been, you know, uh, 16 appearances that I've had to go to the court to finally fix a date. And now we've got those dates at the end of March and uh, we'll see what the courts have to say. But all of this is ridiculous. All of this is outrageous. <coughs> and uh, you know, we're just here every week telling the same story over and over again. Okay, show the signs. I know, we got the signs out there. Oops. This guy just hit me with his truck. Oh, dear. <laughs> Take his number. Well, well that's too bright. Uh, is it too bright? Howdy. Yeah. Is there settings on it? There are settings uh, on can it. Can we turn it, it off? Or? Uh, I got the setting over here. Okay, there you go. I got a light on you right now, right? <laughs> Yeah. There we go, there we go. Hey, That's better. That's better. Yeah, much better. So it's a little bit warm in here. We've got the propane heater stuff going on. It's not all that great to have propane heat inside a closed space. We do, you get the window open? We do uh, you know, vent it out and the windows open regularly and what have you. But uh, otherwise it would be just way too cold. Everybody's got all their winter garb on, several layers happening. And, and yet, uh, you know, 
we're still uh, we're still making it work. We've never missed a minute uh, of our time here and all the time that we've been doing this. 17 and a half. Uh, I'm not going to bother you guys. You're all busy. Uh, I'm just going well, to so sign up. Oh, my goodness. You want to say something, Dexter? I, no, now I we never have any more to say. Yeah, I am. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good Good Ted's over there, yeah. Uh, Goodwill to all, everybody, for 2024. May <laughs> it be better than the last three. Yeah. <laughs> and if you notice, Ted's beard's a little bit shorter, yeah, but it always sits. Yeah, like this. He's only 20 minutes old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every, every January he does that. <laughs> Every June too? Yeah, Is it June and January? Oh, okay. Every January and July first. Okay, June and July first. So yes, that's every six months then, right? Gotcha. And, and do you give your beard to charity? No. Oh. You could it's charity. I wonder. I wonder it's if you charity. could. Nobody like would want pubic hair on their face. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's public hair. You got it wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's out in the public. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you mixed in now. Yeah, wait, wait, wait till the video's off. <laughs> it's exactly the same, except it's completely different. So anyway, we, we're just you know out here doing as best we can to, to keep warm, to keep the spirits up, to keep helping people. Uh, it's what we have to do. You know, the, the government thinks we could just stop doing this somehow, that we shouldn't do this because it's not part of their regulations. Well, they, they must be brain dead to think that that's the case because when you've been doing this for almost seven years, you know most of the people that come to the window by name, you could tell, you could tell somebody else most of their life story because we've heard it all from everybody. We're supposed to say, hey, sorry, yes. Fred, Bill, James, Ted... Cindy, yes, Elizabeth, yes. all these people we know that are that are that are now doing be much better in their life because we've been here helping them. We're supposed to say sorry about that. There's crack dealers on the other street. You, it'll help you out, but the government won't allow you to have easy access to cannabis. So it's the most ridiculous thing. It is it is so so stupid. It makes zero sense. It's a logic free zone, but it makes dollars. It makes huge huge dollars. As I started out to say earlier on in the show. This is not about a legal marketplace trying to satisfy the needs of the Canadian public. It is not about the domestic marketplace. This is about the export of cannabis. In the next two or three years, they figure it's going to balloon up to to five billion or fifty billion dollars, and within five years, it'll be at a hundred billion dollars. This is why you can't have cheap cannabis. This is why you're aunt or your your mother or someone you know that has serious medical issues and needs some higher dose edibles that she could get from a storefront because they don't have the ability to get it themselves this is why they can't get the medicine that they need this is why people are addicted to drugs and not being given the way out because they want to make tons of money they've monetized the overdose crisis they've monetized the legalization of cannabis it's at our expense it's at the expense of the poor people and the sick people it's not something we can stand for none of us should be okay with this even if you're in some remote community and now you've got a cannabis store and, and it's not any much more expensive than it was be before it was uh, legalized it's still not okay. Just because you can buy cannabis at $12 a gram in your little store and you're not a criminal anymore, doesn't mean that this legalization is okay. It should not be supported. It is the reason that the sick people that need it, the poor people that need it, and the people that are addicted that need it, can't get easy, low barrier access. So do what you can. Get off your couch, write a letter, have a protest, make a phone call, talk to people. Don't, don't let it go. Don't be okay with it. It's not okay. It is far from okay. And on an even a much bigger level than that multiple tens of billions of dollar level is the level on which it is just simply not right. It is not right that we are told that we are free people and we deserve to be free people. And we're told we're living in a free country and damn it, it should be a free country even though it costs us all a lot to have a federal government. But this is about freedom at its core. If farmers are not allowed to grow a plant that is less harmful than just about any other plant that they're growing, that is beneficial to people, simply to protect the bottom line profits of greedy corporatists, this is very wrong. We are not free, and we need to do something about it. So do all that you can. 
Make it part of your life, part of what you do. You'll find there's great joy, benefit, and energy in being part of a solution rather than just being complacent and allowing a problem to continue. But most important while you're doing all of that is live your own life. Look after yourself. Look after your family and your friends. Life is short. It's far too serious to take too serious. Make sure, more than anything, moment by moment, you're having as much fun as you can. See you next week.